this is just, I should start off by saying this was, this was the brief I was given. Um, inclusive learning, empowering students to learn independently, work independently and live independently. And my first response to Alan when he said to me, I don't know anything about people living or if you know, what do I know about that? You know, so anyway, I'm going to give you my view of that brief. Is that OK? Um, other people will have a different view and people are um, far more expert at me than me in providing specific um, independent living skills. We don't do that in Colester College, those type of programs, but um, I'm going to come at it from a slightly different viewpoint. So uh, being an academic, I'm going to throw out the uh, uh, definition. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the profile of PLC students nationally. And PLC stands for Post Leaving Cert Course, for those who are not familiar with it. And for Colester College in particular, the bulk of what we do are PLC courses, but we do other things. So I'm going to say, well, what, what's my day job like? What do I mean then by access to further education, which is usually a big, big question. A little bit about successful participation and independent learning. And then at the end, well, does it work? So I'm going to give you some of our figures in terms of successful completion rates and progression. And I'm going to finish with a couple of comments, one from one of our students and one from the mother of a student, an adult student who wrote a letter of support with her application. And I brought it with me because it's one of those special letters that you say, I'm going to hold on to that because that's just remarkable. So this is literally um, the whistle stop tour. I should say from my own background, I'm originally a maths teacher, maths and computer science. Um, and I've been working in further education since it started in Ireland in 1985. And I've been through it all uh, from the beginning, as it were. That sounds really gross to say like that. But I've been through all the various stages. And um, the one thing about being in further education, it's highly exciting. It is not boring. My God, it's not boring. Certainly at the moment, there are major, major changes going on, and it's really exciting. So um, we look forward to the outcome of the SIG, the TAG, and all the other acronyms. And as a maths teacher, of course, I'm very comfortable with acronyms, but that's for another day. OK, starting off with inclusion, well, what do we mean by inclusion? Like, there's multiple definitions of inclusive education. And this is the one I use as being closest to what I mean by inclusive education. And I'll take it from Ainsco and Booth in 2002, which would be from their index of inclusion uh, that they published in, the, in that year. Inclusive education is about improving the quality of learning for all students by dealing with barriers to accessing, participating, and succeeding in learning, whoever experiences them, and whenever they are, wherever they are located throughout our, all aspects of our college, our culture, our policies, and our practice. And in Ireland, and I'm starting to use this terminology now, we're looking at universal design in education, a design for all concept from that point of view. Now, it's not just about services, but I'm interested in universally designed procedures. You can have a procedure, or you can say, I do a service, but do I provide the service in a universally designed way? So I am interested personally in that in the way we do things. Now, the definition of independent, when I, when I was told I had to do something on independent living and independent learning, what do I mean by independent? And I started to say, well, we're all emotional, social beings. The idea of me being on my own for any length of time, personally, I would find extremely difficult because I like people. I like to be with people. As you could probably gather, I'm a bit of a chatterbox. So um, we are start off fundamentally an emotional, social being. So when I mean by independent, I don't mean solitary. I basically mean non-dependent. You can do, you have the choice to do things without the assistance of others, as a, or as much as possible. Some people need assistance for various things, that's fine. But that's as close as I mean to independent as I can get, OK? But through education support, sorry, through the education, supporting the student to develop self-confidence, self-reliance, and independence, I think uh, Lee, in her, in her presentation this morning, said that a lot of students with disabilities would have, um, a, there'd be a high instance of lack of self-confidence, lack of self-esteem. And believe it or not, that they are not uncommon. It's not something exclusive to students with disabilities. A lot of adult learners who are returning, people who have lost their job and have to return to education, equally would have 
their self-confidence has taken a hammering and their self-esteem and their sense of self-worth. So a lot of what we do is, okay, the course has a particular content, but in the manner in which we deliver it and the manner in which we support our students to deliver it, we try to rebuild that self-confidence as much as we can. Facilitating successful participation. Again, in the end of the day, we do as teachers do not do the learning. The student does the learning. We facilitate that learning. And just as with, if I can use that awful term, able-bodied students, disabled students or students with disabilities can be just as lazy as anyone else when it comes to not studying when they should be and all that kind of fun stuff. And very much this is something I really do strongly believe in. We are not about minding people with disabilities. This is about active citizenship. We provide the support for you to participate. We expect the performance just like we expect it from everybody else. This is the profile of, of Colester College, just to give you a flavour of what we do. Our full-time students, we're part of City of Dublin VC. I should have said that from the outset. Our full-time day students will be made up of 380 full-time students, which will be on PLC, post-leaving cert courses, which will be one or two-year courses certified at VTAC levels five and six. I'm going to start saying things, and if people don't understand, by all means, just put your hand up and, I, and I, I'll explain it. VTOS stands for Vocational Training Opportunity Scheme. It is for people who are long-term unemployed who wish to return to education. It's a specific program, but it's full-time, so that's why it's included there. We have two class groups of those. The bulk are in our PLC. Part-time day, we have 170 under the Back to Education initiative. This will be at levels three and four on the national framework. In addition, we have about 350 in our evening school. That has taken both the part-time day and a part-time evening have taken a hammering during the, the recent recession. We had 550 in our part-time day and 1,100 at night, but due to cutbacks, that has taken a major hammering. So that gives you some sort of a sense of it. Our total in the building at the moment during the day is eight, about 800. We have, in addition to that, about another uh, 1,200, 1,400 um, in the local community in adult uh, basic education. So in all, I'm responsible for about 2,200 students. OK, so that gives you some sort of a sense of it. During the day, this gives you a sense. Now, these are last year's figures. Uh, we're only compiling this year. So this just gives you a sense of last year. Last year, at enrolment, 102 of our, of our daytime students, which would be the total between the 380 full-time and the 170 part-time. So what's that quick maths figure? Is 550. Isn't that right? Have I got that right? Yeah. Yeah. Ish. God, like, ask me to do sums without a calculator now is just, you know, it's difficult. OK, so of that bunch, 102 have declared a learning support need. They, did, they ticked the box at application. Of that, 80 were in the full-time PLC, 2 were in the core VTOS group, and 20 were in the part-time Back to Education Initiative students, the part-time day students, giving us a total um, of 18.54% of our daytime population have declared a disability or a learning support need. The learning support need could be literacy support. It may not actually be technically called disability in the strictest sense. Is that okay? I, remember, I work on the basis the person who has a barrier to access, a barrier to participation, whatever that is, whatever that is. Of that 102, 41 required additional learning support. 21 of which were funded through the HEA's Fund for Students with Disabilities, which is the same fund that the third level colleges use, and the remainder were supported in class. I'll come back to that particular point, which I think is going to be an important point. Just another profile. We, do not, we don't do junior cert or leaving cert. We only do further ed. So the youngest person in the building is 17. The eldest is 84. You can see the age ranges from the age range for the full-time students is 17 to 82. The average age is 26. The age range for our part-time day is 21 to 84. Average age is 45. International students, and they like the phrase international students. God help me from the phrase non-national. They have a nationality. It just doesn't happen to be Irish. All right? They like to be called international students, and that's what we call them. Okay? 
You can see there we have 59 international students from 26 countries, so obviously the whole dimension of supporting English as a, as a second language. And, and God bless them, some of them are coming and English is a fifth language. It puts you to shame. Prior to enrolment, now this is an interesting one. We, we survey all our students at enrolment to find out, well, what were you doing before you came to us? And what was the highest level of education you had before you came to us? Prior to enrolment, LC stands for Leaving Cert. 31.29% of our students had just come from their Leaving Cert. So those who started in September last year had just done their Leaving Cert in June. Only one, less than one in three of our students came directly from Leaving Cert. And we're a post leaving cert college. So you begins to so the whole label of post leaving cert starts to be a little bit rubbery. People forty point eight one percent came directly from unemployment. Just shows you how it's shifted. Prior to the prior education before they started with us, forty nine point four seven percent had leaving cert. In other words, less than half of our students had their leaving cert coming into us and 13.89% had no higher than junior cert equivalent or lower secondary. The biggest learning support issue that I have to deal with on a daily basis is lack of prior formal qualifications. It's not disability, it's not special need, even though that's a huge chunk, it is lack of prior formal learning. Huge, absolutely an enormous part of what we have to do. Access. We have to have an admissions policy and a procedure, as most places do. How do I get into the co how do I get into the course? What are the criteria? All those good stuff. But then again, if you're an inclusive college, on what grounds do you say no? Okay, what are the grounds you say no? Do you let everybody in? Do you let somebody onto a course where the course is too difficult for them? I think I think that's actually ethically unsound to do that. In other words. Are we in danger of setting the students up to fail? Now, equally, having a course that trains somebody in redundant skills that are no longer needed is equally setting somebody up to fail in the jobs market. But just in terms of allowing them into our courses, setting something up, setting somebody up to fail, I think, is ethically unsound. So we have replaced entry requirements with the capacity to successfully participate. Coming back to what Fiona talked about in terms of recognition of prior learning, we take a holistic view and try to evaluate the totality of your learning. Some people will come to me as a former maths teacher and say, I can't do maths. It was useless at sums, but then they'll tell you that they have an interest in horse racing and they'll, do, they'll start to describe betting. Now, I know nothing about horse racing and even less about betting. And I'm out with the pencil and paper trying to follow what they're talking about. They're talking to multiples and triples and double this. And I have no idea. And they can do this in their head and they can't do maths. You sort of have to, sorry, well, you can do maths. It's just a different type of maths than they do in school. There's stuff like that. People read. Some people come into me, they left a primary school, yet they can read Ulysses. I wouldn't, re I wouldn't read Ulysses if you put a gun to my head. And so on. So we talk in the totality. Do you read? What do you read? How, what type of things do you talk about? So it's a, at the interview, there is this evaluative process goes on. Incidentally, having the Leaving Cert is an indication of a capacity to successfully participate. But it's only one. Is that fair enough? OK. And you have to be able to successfully participate in both the classroom element and the work placement element. Because on the work on the leave on the post leaving cert course, completing the work placement element and passing it is a mandatory requirement of all post leaving cert courses. So therefore, if you cannot participate in the work placement element, there's no point in you even starting the course because you won't be able to finish it successfully. And ethically, that's a problem for me. Does that make sense? Okay. We use a self declaration model. In other words, we ask you. Do you have a disability and or learning difficulty, yes or no? You're more than entitled to say no, even if you do. We don't force it, OK? Some people have felt, oh my god, if they call me special needs one more time, I'll scream, which is a perfectly legitimate feeling, perfectly legitimate. People want to try it without the support, and that's perfectly fine. We can always add the support in later if we need to, but that's perfectly fine. 
We use what we term a functional deficit model of learning support. The learning support we give you will depend on the course that we offer. Unlike a secondary school where everybody does first year, everybody does second year, and so on and so on and so on, I have 17 different courses across <laughs> six departments. So you can go from art to business to childcare to data networking to photography, uh, landscape gardening, and so on and so forth. If you are doing business studies with us, it is basically a classroom-based activity. So what we, we know the demands of the course. You know your own particular situation. So a conversation takes place. And out of that, we develop what we term our learning support agreement, which might be an individual ed education plan, as Jennifer mentioned earlier on. And what that is, is we say, right, out of this, you may need one, two, three, four, and five. Everything is signed off, so it's agreed. But it's a starting point and is subject to ongoing review. Everybody with me so far? OK, I think I make perfect sense in my head, but it's just when it comes out, it might necessarily. If you were doing landscape gardening, again, your needs haven't changed, but the demands of the course have. So we now start putting in a different set of supports to identify your need to the particular curricular demand of the course. Does that make sense? All right, so that's what I mean by a functional deficit model. Now, the application process. I'm focusing on this a little bit because ultimately, once you get in, that's a big hurdle dealt with. The admissions policy, OK, there's uh, the entry requirements, this formal business that is often out there. What has been termed by the OECD in the 1970s, the credentials barrier. Before you can get in, you have to have a piece of paper to get in. But I need to get in to get the piece of paper. There's kind of the chicken and egg sort of stuff. The next stage that happens is the evaluation of the application. Have you met the standard? Have you demonstrated a capacity to successfully participate or not? So you've met the standard or you haven't. So let's say you have met the standard. Then, and this is probably the most significant part of this whole process. The process of offering applications. The CAO does what I term the creaming off approach. They will give it to the top so many. We have 24 places. We get the top 24, get it. Right? What's happening in further ed at the moment is that because of an increasing number of people who are unfortunately being laid off and returning to further education, they are, inverted commas, more academically able, perhaps, and they are getting places ahead of others who were more traditionally the target group, if I can use that awful phrase, of people with, uh, of further education. What we have used in Colester College, and a lot of colleges use, we use a first come, first served approach. Once you meet the requirement, we, we put the applications in date order, and we offer them in the date order. Now, equally, that discriminates against people who, are of a, who have a nomadic lifestyle, such as the traveller, travelling community. But there's an element of there's pluses and minuses to everything. And on balance, uh, with all due respect to the travelling community uh, members, I've gone with first come, first served. And I, you know, nothing's perfect, but that's the one I've gone with. Here's one that, again, I will contrast with our CAO colleagues. The CAO has added DARE and here, mature student entry and possibly one other, I can't remember. But there's all these separate different bits for applying. So you have to say, I'm a student with a disability, I'm applying through the DARE scheme. And then again, not all third level colleges are participating in the DARE scheme. So that's, that's another question. Then there's the HERE scheme and so on and so forth. In further ed, we have one door. Everybody comes through the same door. What are you interested in? I'm interested in, I, I would like to apply for the business studies course. So we'll sit down and we'll have a conversation and you'll fill out the form. And, it's, and then there'll be a learning support. You may or may not tick the box for learning support. Have you any prior qualifications? No, I left school early, didn't get on, but, but for whatever reason. Um, I would say fine and we'll have a conversation and try and make an evaluation. Now, there are various stages which I won't bore you with, but there, we, we, have, we have three levels of referral within our admissions process, so I won't bore you with those. But 
there is an evaluative process. If you indicate a stu that you have a learning support need, you are immediately sent to talk to our access officer and our disability support officer. So the so the we begin the conversation about your needs at application stage, not when you come in the door, but at the application stage. Is everybody okay? Everybody with me so far? Now, just to give a full and total, and you know, given that we're we're talking about forms of words, this is the definition I use for access to any course that we offer. It is the process by which a learner may commence a program where on the basis of a recognition of all prior learning, he, she has demonstrated the capacity to successfully participate with the appropriate level of support on the academic, practical and work placement elements of the programme and achieve the award upon completion. I don't think I've left any bits out, but that I think is pretty much where we're at. How am I on time, Shane? I'm ahead of myself. Okay, fantastic. All right, so once you're in, let's go on to successful participation. Now, people have mentioned CPD and all of that kind of thing, and it is absolutely crucial. A lot, there's a huge absence of trained people. Like, it's, it's fine to say, uh, and correct to say, that uh, inclusive methodologies and practice is now part of pre-service training, and absolutely should be the case. But people of my vintage and beyond, uh, you know, and so on, it, it just didn't exist in my day. Didn't, nobody mentioned it, good, bad, or indifferent. So that's a big change, but there's also a whole cohort of the, of the teaching profession who, who never received any of this in their pre-season training, or pre-season. There, there's a, the Heineken Cup is about to start, lads, like I'm getting a bit edgy, right? Um, the, um, in, their pre-service training, okay? So we engaged in a lot of um, European projects through Lergos and, and so on in this whole area and we engaged in a significant amount of in-service training in the whole area of teaching and learning methodologies. Now it's interesting, I was, I was intrigued with, with Anne's uh, opening remarks when she talked about the sorting hat scene in Harry Potter. We use the exact same scene to talk about learning styles. Okay, you're in the visual learning group and the hat then says, oh you're in the aural learning group and you're in the kinesthetic learning group, and so on and so forth. Now, I know there's other learning groups, but that just gives you the idea. If you are only chalk and talk, if you are only standing at the top of the room, you are only talking to some of the room. You have to mix it up. So we got into the whole idea. We shifted our focus from teaching to learning, and we focused on student learning. Or put it another way, if our students do not learn the way we teach, then we must teach the way our students learn. Full stop, that's it. The philosophy doesn't get any more complicated than that. Ongoing CPT. In the area of inclusion, the use of ICT within the teaching <coughs> is a requirement. You cannot, cannot meet your obligations under, under equality legislation or under the, the moral obligations of being a teacher without the use of, EC, uh, of ICT. We've been using Moodle and web-based learning since 2004, and we've just been the first further education college in the country, I believe, to deploy fully Google Apps from September. So our entire, our entire computer system is in the, in the cloud. Or to, to use the, the uh, advertising slogan that I've been using recently, we don't teach cloud computing, we use cloud computing to teach. I thought it was good anyway, but there you are. <laughs> I'm getting t-shirts printed as we speak. Okay, we have an access officer and a visiting disability support officer. We're part of the City of Dublin VEC Disability Support Service, which is provided from a National Learning Network. We're one of eight colleges that, provide, that have this service. And Eileen Daly, our DSO, she's fantastic. She comes to us every Monday and supports um, our access officer who's there all the time. The care team, I was interested to see the well-being question, it's something I would absolutely completely agree with. Um, one of the things we have with people with disabilities um, would be loneliness, I'd have to say. Loneliness. They are alone in the crowd kind of thing. And it is something we struggle with and we try to, we try to work with. 
most of our courses are 25 teaching weeks in length. So it's not like, a, we say, a mainstream school where you have a number of years to develop relationships. It tends to be short and sharp. So it's to try and str we struggle with that one. The importance of the communication module. Communications is a mandatory module on all post leaving cert courses. And it is a mandatory module at all the various levels, three, four, five, and so on. We would have students who would have come to us who have no experience of success in education, no experience of it. People who have lived in an isolated existence, people with disabilities and so on. Through communications, they develop the skill and the practice of discussing among their class group and having conversations with others that they wouldn't necess ne necessarily normally have. And one of the quotations will be from one such student in a few minutes. It is hugely important that communications is um, as a foundation for everything else. It facilitates the learning in everything else. We've talked about inclusive access. I've done the whistle -top stop version of inclusive participation. Inclusive outcome, which is always the difficult one. People are familiar with the junior cert and the leaving cert state exam system and all of that. And I uh, congratulate Anne and her colleagues in NCCA for the, the, the new junior cert reforms and I look forward to their outcome. Um, inclusive outcome in the fee tax system was designed to be accessible from the beginning. There is a requirement in the fee tax certification, uh, precisely procedure uh, B64, which talks about reasonable accommodation in, as in assessment methodology. So we can actually substitute one assessment method for another to make the assessment system accessible. That's, and that is a requirement of all fee tax providers. They are required to have procedures to be able to do that. And that has made a whole new thing. Now, this is a, this is a key slide. Building capacity, and it kind of comes into the, the inclusive framework and how inclusive are we and all this. You can see the, the blue dot, the blue lines up on top, would be the number of students who have declared a learning support need each year at enrolment. The pink dot, pink dotted line, are the number of people who actually needed to meet our disability support officer. The difference are the number of people who are supported through inclusive learning and teaching in the classroom. At no cost, I hasten to add, to the state. The teacher is already being paid. All we had to do was train them. Now, that's I'm saying all we had to do. It was a significant job. I think Jennifer mentioned two to three years to bring this whole the framework in place. I would agree with that, because what you are talking about doing is getting is asking people to change the way they do their job. And some people might have been doing a job the same way for a number of years, but you are now asking people to do the job differently. And for any of us, in fairness, that's not an easy thing to do. So it takes time. So basically, the difference between the pink and the blue is free. And we deal with that in the classroom. So that's what I'm talking about, building capacity. Now, the spike, you can see, that is when we were involved in the European projects. Is that all right? Now. Outcomes, has it worked? The retention. Now this was, I took over as principal in Colester College in 2001, so naturally I'm going to use the year before as the point of reference. <laughs> the retention, in other words, the number of people who stayed to the end of the course. 60 to 65% um, stayed in 2000, 2001. By 2010, 11, that had jumped to 80 to 85% retention. VTAC results. Distinction and merit. D is distinction, M is merit. They're the top two grades in fee tax certification. In 2000-2001, in distinction and merits, the total number of grades across all subjects were 55%. The failure rate or unsuccessful, we're very, very gently wording things, unsuccessful we use in fee tax is 20%. 2010 to 2011, the distinction and merit total had jumped to 65%. The failure rate had dropped to 12%. Progression survey, last year, the number of completion last year for the school as a whole was 80.05%. 80 80 Among students receiving learning support, it was 83.87%. Major awards, those who got the full certificate. Now, these are only on PLC courses, I hasten to add, not on all of them, just on the PLC. The major award, they got the full award, 62.12%. 
learning support 58.06%. In level six, the major, those who got level six, 17.06%, 12.9%. Third, progressed onto third level, 16.04%, 9.68%. Unemployed, 26.62% and 16.6%. Uh, 3% unemployed, sorry, unemployed for the first one, unemployed then was 12.63%, 19.02%. I've already got the X, so I'm going to fly onto the comments. This is Jerry O'Brien. Now, I brought this along with me. This was our publication at our 50th anniversary uh, in 2006, and Jerry gave a contribution. Jerry came to us, he was uh, 49 years of age, cerebral palsy, wheelchair user, had been in and out of special education for years, had no formal certificate and no formal recognition of his education ever. He came to us and we were involved in a European project called E4, Employment for, Education for Employment. And I see a few of the partners here in the room and uh, we, we'll have a drink afterwards on it. While I enjoyed my job, and the job was in sheltered employment, there was always a, a part of me that felt I had missed out a large part of my education after completing level four. I felt over the moon at achieving something I thought I'd never achieve in my life. So what's next? Do I want to go back to study at the next level? I was a bit reluctant to go back, but I was persuaded to complete the next level in order to have the skills needed in the workplace. With the help of all the teachers, I managed to complete the course. I've just submitted all my work for this year and the graduation is in a few weeks. Until I get my results, I won't be making any big decisions But what ab about what to do next. Watch this space. The key to this is not just his achievement, and it was significant. And he's a great guy. He came in, he wouldn't say boo to a goose. We've created a monster, he won't shut up. He, has got, he came with us to our end of uh, uh, conference in Europe, to Brussels, and he actually spoke in front of uh, European Commission officials, project people from Poland, Germany, the Netherlands and Ireland. He was absolutely fantastic and still is fantastic. But what I want you to note here is in the middle, after level four, he was a bit reluctant to continue. At the end, when he completed level five, watch this space. That to me is an indication of a change of a buildup of self-confidence, of self-esteem. He had now become independent. This is the extract that of um, the mother's letter. This is the mother's letter. It goes on for pages, all right? Her daughter, who has an intellectual disability, and her daughter will be in her late 20s, fantastic person, uh, came in to me to talk about a course. And it was about, you know, into employment and all that kind of thing. And it was, a, it was an interesting conversation. And I've known the family for a few years, but she wrote this letter. I, it looked to me like a letter she just threw down on a page and off she went. So this is an extract which I think is helpful. Obstacles, yes. Possibilities, absolutely. She has a basic human right as a citizen to be, paid, to be in paid employment. She has a dedication and commitment not seen in a lot of able people, and I suspect a rare empathy that no amount of book learning can teach. She has something valuable to contribute, and should I feel be allowed to have the chance to do what she really wants to. After all, when you get right down to it, this is the real and actual meaning of inclusion. Practice, not theory. I don't see too much point in having belief in her, sorry, having a belief that she can reach her potential and then not have the courage to let her try. It's time to walk the talk. And I thought that was a very powerful statement. I have given the quickest tour imaginable over a decade of my life as a principal. Um, so I hope it has given you some sort of a flavour of what we do. And uh, thank you all very much.